Hello everybody, back again. Uh, today we are getting into Daniel chapter 9. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 is one of the most uh, pivotal passages of prophecy in the Bible. It is uh, very exciting. We're going to take a little detour first and we're going to go into the New Testament. Daniel chapter 9 is going to be dealing with the 69 weeks once we get to the end, but it also could be dubbed as a prayer interrupted. So we're going to see Daniel's prayer and he's going to be interrupted by Gabriel. So with that being said, let's get a little bit different perspective. We're going to flip with me to Matthew chapter 24. Now, he's given the disciples, there's four disciples that he's kind of giving a kind of a private briefing to. And they're walking around and he's it's called, it's also known as the Olivet Discourse. Matthew chapter 24, they're, they're going to ask him some questions. You got Peter, Andrew, James, and John are with Jesus. And of course, in verse 3, it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? That's one. And what will these signs of your coming at the end of the age? So they're going to ask him these questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So they got three questions they're asking him. Okay. And in verse 4, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceives you. Now, he's going to say this, deceive, make, make sure nobody deceives you at the beginning of this chapter. He's also going to follow it up again towards the end of this, that make sure nobody deceives you. How do we protect ourselves from being deceived? One is you have to study the scripture. Uh, you have to take the whole counsel of God, not just part of it, but you got to compare scripture to scripture and take it at the whole counsel. That is the most guaranteed, surefire way that we can guarantee ourselves that we will not be deceived when somebody comes up and says something that sounds kind of off kilter. He says in verse 5, he says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear wars, rumors of wars, See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So he's given them kind of a, that some people say these are signs, uh, these are signs but non-signs, because he's telling them you're going to see these things, but don't worry because the end is not yet. And it says, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And in verse 9, it says, they will deliver you up uh, tribulation and kill you and be hated by all nations for my sake. And many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will, will rise up and deceive many. And because the lawlessness will abound and the love of many will, will grow cold. But he endures to the end shall be saved. And this is the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world and witness to all the nations that will, end will come. And verse 15 says, Therefore... When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. So he's telling you, to, when you read this, understand it. And he's speaking to these Jewish dis disciples over here. I want to ask you a question. Jesus is pointing you back to uh, the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Okay, Daniel the prophet had spoke about this. So Jesus, in one sense, has saved you a bunch of time and effort if you go on a rabbit trail on trying to uh, study on who actually wrote the book of Daniel. I know there's some people that try to deny that Daniel actually wrote the book, but Jesus answers it for, for you right here. He says, when you see the abominations of desolation, that was referring to what we covered in chapter 8 when Antiochus Epiphany set up a, uh, a statue inside the Holy of Holies. And of course, they sacrificed, he sacrificed a pig on the altar and spread the blood around. There's going to be another event that's going to happen later on, and that's what Jesus is pointing to. But I want you to look at something here. It says, spoken by the prophets, standing in the holy place. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay. How can you see, well, let me ask the question this way. Who goes into the Holy of Holies? The high priest. One time a year, and that's at Yom Kippur, and that's a special, yeah, special preparations have to be made. 
how are they going to be able to see the abomination of desolation if only the high priest can is allowed to go into the Holy of Holies? I will suggest to you that this is going to be a, uh, such a significant uh, event that it's going to be covered by TV state news stations. That's the only way that people can are going to be able to see that this happened. But he says, whoever uh, reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him on the housetop uh, not go down, take anything off his house, and let him who is in the field not to go back uh, to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant in those days or nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight not, uh, may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For... Uh, there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until the time nor shall ever be. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved, but the elect's sake for those days shall be shortened. Okay, so he's saying, you know, for those um, people that are in Judea, flee to the mountains. He's speaking to a Jewish community here. And he's saying that, and pray that your flight not be in winter or on the Sabbath day. And he's going to go and, you know, say that uh, unless those days were shortened, no flesh will be saved, but for the elect's sake, and those days shortened. And, of course, he's going to go on and describe, you know, some other things. But um, he's telling them don't be deceived, and he's giving them some trigger points and some things to happen that are going to be a trigger for this event. And to get a true understanding of what this is talking about, we need to get back to Daniel chapter 9. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, in the lineage of the Medes, who was making, uh, who made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood the books, the number of years specified that the uh, word of the Lord, through Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Okay, so he's been reading the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, uh, and, it's gonna, and also Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, verses 10. It shows that Daniel took Jeremiah literally, so he's reading this. Flip with me, if you will. I'm going to go to Jeremiah chapter 25, and I'm reading verses 11 and 12. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and the nation shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it shall come to pass when 70 years are complete that I will punish the king of Babylon that, and that nation. The land of the Chaldeans for the iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make a perpetual desolation. Okay, so that's in, verse, that's in chapter 25, verses 11 and 12. And then I'm flipping to um, chapter 29, verses 10. It says, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you and cause you to return to this place. Daniel's reading this part of uh, Jeremiah. If you knew that the Lord was coming back in two days, what would you do? Besides, you know, hallelujah, great. <laughs> Let, let's, let's get it on, you know, let's get out of here. Uh, what does Daniel do? He starts to pray. And he knows that there's an end coming to this time period, and he's been studying it. So what is he going to do? He's going to go into his prayer. And in verse 3, he says, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make a request by prayer, supplication, fasting, and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord God and made confessions. O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him, and with those who keep his commandments, and have, we have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and rebelled, even departing from your precepts and your judgments. So he's praying, you know, we, you know, Daniel, he's one of the few people in here that nothing, no ill will is said, or actually uh, nothing bad said about him. And there's a, another one other than Jesus, but there's another one in the Old Testament, and that was Joseph. But he's even lumping himself as a corporately that they as a nation have rejected God or have sinned and turned their backs and not kept the precepts and he's putting himself right in there in the mix with them but he's praying 
as we get on down through this prayer, you can almost hear, hear him tremble as he reads this prayer. And of course, verse six, it says, neither have we heeded your servants, your prophets, who spoke your name to our kings and our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, uh, as it is this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all of Israel. Those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven and become because of the unfaithfulness of they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings and princes and our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord God belong, uh, belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him and we have not obeyed his voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which we have set before us, his servants, the prophets. Yes, all of Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he has spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster for under whole heaven, such has never been done as was done to Jerusalem. So he's, he's really, you know, he's really pouring it out here. In verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all the disasters come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, and we might turn from our iniquities, understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept this, kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us for the Lord our God is righteous. And, um, and all the words which he does, we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. And verse 16 says, O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger, your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and our iniquities and our fathers, Jerusalem, your people are a reproach for all of us around us. And now, therefore, God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplication for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes, see your desolations in the city which is called by your name for we Do not uh, present our supplications before you because our, of our righteous deeds, but because your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O, o Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city, your people are called by your name. Okay. He's really pouring his heart out to God. Um, and you can almost, when you read this, you can almost hear him tremble, you know, through this prayer. It says, now, now he's going to shift gears. Now he's going to narrate what he was, when he was praying. He says, now when I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin, the sin of my people, presenting my supplication before the Lord, before the holy mountain of God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, Gabriel, whom I had sent the vision at the beginning, caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, and he informed me and talked with me, Oh, Daniel, I have come forth to give you skill, understanding at the beginning of your supplication. The command went out, and I came to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So, some translations might have the evening ob oblation, this one, he says, at the evening offering is what it's saying here. Question, where is the evening offering being offered at? Because Jerusalem's about 400 miles to the west of where Daniel's at, and it's in rubble right now, uh, the temple is. So there's no offering happening. But in Daniel's mind, or it hasn't been happened, or happening for at least 70 years, at least. But in Daniel's mind, is still the same time. So he hasn't changed. He's kept these things. So he realizes what time it is. He's still dialed in to their precepts and their laws. Verse 23, at the beginning of the supplication, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Okay. I want to give you a little bit of uh, something you may not have picked up on. 
when you study the scripture. And I think it's very fascinating when you put it into context. Genesis chapter 18. God, it's, God considers Abraham a friend. And in Genesis chapter 18, he's going to say, Shall I not tell Abraham for what I'm about to do? And he considers Abraham a friend. Okay. Matthew chapter 24, these four disciples, you know, in the upper room, Jesus says, you know, you guys, he says, you are my servants. Now you're my friend. I consider you my friends. And he tells them this in the upper room. Well, he's going to tell these guys, he's going to give them some insights on his second coming. So it's kind of interesting that with the friend status, you get kind of some insight on what God's going to do. Well, let's take this a little step further. Okay. Who's the most, who's beloved in the Old Testament? Well, Daniel. It just says right here. Let's fast forward to the New Testament. Who is the beloved in the New Testament? John. Okay. Isn't it interesting that Daniel and John both get apocalyptic insight to what's going to happen? So it almost suggests if you're a friend of God, you've got, you know, you get kind of shown some things that are going to happen. But if you are beloved, you've got the real inside track, inside baseball, of what's going to happen. I just think that's kind of fascinating when you start looking at it that way. And, and that was their merit badge of how true or how of a friend they were because they got shown some insight. Um, I just think that's interesting. So Gabriel's going to give him some understanding. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of uh, sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay. And that's the most holy place also. So that's where we get that there's going to be another temple built because that's uh, the Holy of Holies. Verse 25, it says, Now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay. It says, And the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. Okay, there's a lot packed in here. He says, Now understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, that's trigger point number one, until the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay. We got a specific time point from the time that the institution of the building of the uh, city, that there's going to be 62 weeks, and it says the street shall be built again and the wall. So the wall around uh, Jerusalem. Let me ask you a question. For how many decrees were there to rebuild the wall. There's one. There's four decrees. Three of them actually were dealing with the rebuilding of the temple. And it's not till you get to Nehemiah chapter 2 verses uh, 5 through 8 that deals with, and again 17, 18, that actually is going to deal with the city. The other ones uh, from Cyrus, where you get from Ezra chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, are going to talk about the temple only. And again, in Ezra chapter 6, uh, 1 through 5, and then 8 and 12 is going to deal with the temple only. And then our Xerxes again in Ezra chapter 7, they're talking about the temple, not the city. Nehemiah is going to deal with the city, and that's a distinction that Gabriel's given him. So that's what, that's this trigger point. And it says, and it's going to be done even in trouble sometimes. And it says, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. From that trigger point until the Messiah is cut off, and it's not for himself, that's going to refer to Jesus, none other than Jesus. 
there's a book called The Coming Prince by Sir Walter Anderson. He wrote a book and was able to give these dates. Now these weeks that they're talking about is actually weeks of years. The 69 week that we're dealing with, this is after the 69 between the seven, um, he shall be cut off. But that book, The Coming Prince by Robert Anderson, dates that from Nehemiah chapter two, or the decree to go back and build the city was done on March 14th, 445 BC. And from that time, when you go back and you see when Jesus comes in, you say uh, 69 times seven, and that comes up to be 173,880 days. We see that when Jesus comes riding in, Zechariah chapter nine, verses nine, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and from the horse of Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His, down, his dominion shall be from sea to sea and the river it ends on the earth. Okay. Zechariah chapter 9 is going to talk about the Messiah when he comes. Okay. Luke chapter 19, the triumphal entry of Jesus. When it came to pass, he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany and the mountain called Olivet, and that he sent two of his disciples, say, Go into the, into the village opposite you, where you will enter and uh, find a colt tied in which no one has ever loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, why are you loosening it? You shall say, because the Lord has need of it. And so they were sent their way and found it. And he said, but they loosed the cult owner. So why are you loosening it? He says, the Lord has need uh, of him. They brought him to Jesus and they threw the clothes on the cult. Jesus went and then he spread their clothes on the road. Now, he was drawing near to the ascent the Mount of Olives, and the multitude of disciples began to rejoice, praise God with loud voice, mighty works. And blessed is the King who comes in His name of the Lord. Peace and glory to in the highest. Okay. So when you read something, and the Pharisees always come to the rescue if you miss something, because they understand what Jesus actually is declaring here. He is declaring that He is fulfilling that Zechariah chapter 9. And of course, it says, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered, said to them, I tell you, if I should keep quiet, these stones would immediately cry out. And what a great segue. If, you ever, if you've ever been to Israel and you've been down that road and follow in the footsteps of Jesus, and when you go into that area where it's, uh, you know, where he's rode in on the donkey, you can grab you a small stone. They're free. They're not going to cost you anything, but you can set it up on a plaque and you can sit in your office or at your house when somebody comes by and you they ask, well, what is that? And you say, well, that's one of the stones that didn't cry out. Um, and you can go from Luke 19 to back into Daniel chapter 9. You can use that. It says, now when he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you especially in this day, the things that make your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, okay? Because they didn't recognize him coming in. They were hidden. It's like a judicial blindness that is cast over them. They are hidden from them. And it says, for the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within within you into the ground and they will not leave you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Wow. Jesus actually told them because they did not recognize. They should have known the signs and the times, but they didn't even recognize it that he 
pronounces a judicial blindness upon Israel because of that and told them because they didn't see it. And that's kind of chilling when you think about it because he's telling them basically they should have kept up with the prophecy and, and known about it to be able to see. And I know some people have a don't like prophecy or don't think it's that important, but Jesus held them account for that reason, for not understanding the times. And he wept over it because he knew what was coming and because they missed it. They missed the mark. Let me flip to Romans chapter 11 real quick. Let me read this to you. There's another one to back up why, what Jesus did. It says, Romans uh, 11, verses 25, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. And, also, and so all Israel will be saved as is written. Okay. So till the time, the fullness of the Gentiles be fulfilled, Israel is blinded. Serious stuff. But back to what I was saying, when you take the dates from Nehemiah chapter 2, from March 14th, from the decree from Artaxerxes in Nehemiah, from March 14th, 445 B.C., to Christ's ministry began in the fall of 28 A.D. Uh, and, of course, that was the year Tiberius was appointed in 14 A.D. And his triumphal entry happened, they estimated from the book, on April 6, 32 A.D. Okay, when you take that time period from March 14th, 445 B.C. through April the 6th, 32 A.D. was 173,740 days. From March uh, 14th through April the 6th of that same year, when Jesus rides in from that time, it was 24 days. Then when you add the leap years in, that was 116 days. That brings you to a grand total of 100, 173,880 days, 69, or 69 weeks to the exact T. What was Gabriel's margin of error? Zero. Dead on the money. And it's fascinating to me how, how dialed in the scriptures are. So after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, because he went to the cross and died for us, for you and me, for our sins, that if we believe him and confess him as our Lord and Savior, we shall be saved, repent and um, Turn away and accept and believe him. Okay. It says, And the people of the prince who was to come after Jesus was um, crucified in 70 AD, we see the Romans are going to come in and they're going to destroy the temple and they're going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. And this, uh, in the end, shall be with the flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. So we see. Uh, that the people of the prince are going to come in and destroy. Now, who are the people of the prince? Well, the, the ones that destroyed the temple in AD 70 were the Romans. Now, there's the eastern leg and a western leg of the Roman Empire, and the eastern leg outlived the Roman Empire for around about a thousand years that it survived on. And there's uh, this prince who is to come, is none other than the Antichrist. And, and it says that uh, they shall destroy the sanctuary and the end shall be with the flood and the, the end of the war desolations are determined. There shall be confirmed a covenant with many for one week. Okay, now he's going to start describing what we know as the tribulation period. Now, the great tribulation is only for a three and a half year period. There's a seven year this one week that they're talking about is a seven year period, but in the middle of this thing, at the beginning, he's gonna enforce a covenant with them or confirm a covenant 
with many for a week. But in the middle of that week, he shall bring an end of sacrifice and offering. So, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even unto the consummation which is determined is poured out on uh, poured out on the desolate. Okay, so he's describing another abomination of desolation. Now we saw it back in chapter eight. Antiochus Epiphanes did it already one time. There's going to be a new temple that's built in future, and there's going to be an institute uh, institution. I guess, of the sacrificial system again. And we're going to see that this Antichrist is going to set up a, an image that we'll read about later on, and he's going to cause people to worship him. And he's going to create another abomination of desolation. And, and that's what this is describing. It's deep stuff. Fascinating. And once you understand chapter 9 and put it all in perspective... It helps to understand when you get to Revelation some of the other things that are going on in Revelation. Like I said, when you study Daniel, you got to study Revelation too. They go hand in hand. It's just one was in the new ones in the New Testament, the other ones in the Old Testament. Um, chapter ten, we get there. We're going to get into the dark side a little bit, talking about spiritual warfare, um, kind of some spooky stuff going on there. But it's fascinating and. Uh, you know, we talk about spiritual warfare, but there's a whole list of things that are going on around us that we can't see, and it is real. Uh, so, hope you guys have a great week, um, and I pray a special blessing upon each and every one of you that are watching this, and um, and I pray that the Lord will continue to guide and direct us, and continue to be with us.